Thank you, Dr. Bocarti, for this uh, wonderful overview of the amazing uh, results. Uh, I'm really impressed of that. Uh, I still have some questions waiting for the audience, though. Uh, one is dual antiplatelet treatment. So at the beginning, uh, pipeline uh, devices were uh, linked with uh, a lot of strokes, thrombobolics events. Uh, does uh, this has changed with new devices and dual antiplatelet? It's not the devices that have been have changed. It's the way people use uh, uh, drugs. Um, most of the problems came from the use of uh, uh, clopidogrel, uh, meaning uh, Plavix, which is a drug uh, you cannot really trust uh, a lot. Uh, many people are resistant uh, and you have to work on it. We have never liked uh, clopidogrel and we have never used it. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have not had all these problems that other people have had. Um, today we have different antiplatelets uh, and I think that in most cases this has uh, obtained a diminishing of, of uh, strokes and uh, uh, a thromboembolic complication. Um, yeah, so, uh, so it's the drugs that have changed, not really the flow diverters. They, have, they are trying to make flow diverters that are less uh, thrombogenic. I'm not sure we are there yet. Okay. How many, uh, what is the percentage of uh, endovascular or clipping cases in Nicaragua? In, in, in the in Guarda. In Guarda, <laughs> <in> Nicaragua. <laughs> <laughs> it can be sometime with Marco Gentato, but <laughs> exactly. So we have a wonderful um, um, agreement with Marco Gentato, who is the, our neurosurgeon, one of the best neurosurgeons in for vascular neurosurgeons in, in Italy and also in Europe. So um, we have we really work together very well, especially on AVMs. And in aneurysm, he more or less, uh, you know, he's a little bit sad because we treat a lot of aneurysms more than he does. Uh, but um, when uh, something complicated comes in, then uh, we have a lot of fun of trying, you know, to to mix and to uh, to do things together. He does a lot of bypasses. He does a lot of, uh, for example, he also uses the um, cardiac arrest when there are giant aneurysms. Um, so very complicated techniques. Uh, but for the easy ones, I would say probably eighty percent they are uh, endovascular. End Okay, how many of those are coiled and how many, what is the percentage of uh, flow diverting? So um, uh, the, the coiling, we use it only for uh, uh, ruptured aneurysms and we do it in emergency uh, and usually they are small aneurysms. Uh, the unruptured or incidental aneurysms, we don't treat the small ones. So most of them are one centimeter or more. And so for that reason, coiling is not, really uh, successful and we we use in most of them uh, flow diverters uh, and then uh, if if we are talking about uh, basilar tip aneurysm uh, or in some bifurcation uh, middle separatory bifurcation those uh, may be treated also with the web device uh, which i think maybe you know it's like a little um, ball that you place inside the the the, the, the aneurysm so, but uh, we really prefer flow diverter with, whenever it's possible because we think that extracellular uh, treatment is much better than intracellular treatment because it's less prone to recanalization. Uh, once you it works, it works forever. You have a permanent cure. My last question before heading to Andreas uh, to Alekos Andreu is uh, treating an aneurysm out of uh, circulation, a giant aneurysm can sometimes become, uh, uh, with the PL vascularization, grow. Uh, I mean, we have seen that with occluded uh, giant yeah. aneurysms that they grow as a mass spec. Yeah. Is there any fear that we transform this giant aneurysm with uh, flow diverted to that kind of disease? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Of course, uh, the, the fear is always there in everything we do. We, we know that most of the times it will go uh, well, but we know that sometimes we will not achieve the result we will um, we, we desire. So there is not 100% success rate in anything we do in medicine, especially in our field of medicine. Uh, so yes, we have those uh, 
cases, uh, uh, and this becomes a, a real problem because they keep on growing like tumors. They are not going to rupture, but they are going to grow like tumors. We are in, in the way now to thinking of uh, uh, treating those injuries with gamma knife, like if they were really tumors. And uh, uh, so we have kind of a first real experience and it, it seems to be the right way to go, or at least uh, it could be the right way to go. Okay. So um, but it's interesting. We don't have, of course, any scientific proof so far, but it's like a tumor. So we would like to treat it like a tumor. Alekos. Hello, Dodi. Very nice to see you after a long time. <laughs> really. Thank it's, you. It seems that uh, time uh, is uh, freezed for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, you Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I was very happy to hear that uh, in a high standard uh, uh, center like yours, uh, still 80% of the cases go for embolization and 20 you send them for a surgery. I think that this is a very well uh, balanced uh, uh, decision and situation. Uh, from the technical point of view, I want to ask you two questions. The first is how often you are using uh, two or three, uh, maybe uh, flow diverters, one inside the other, in giant aneurysms from the beginning, uh, before you check it uh, after uh, several months and see that they, they, they are not uh, completely uh, occluded. And the second question is how often and what are the criteria to use the combination of flow diversion with coils? Okay, uh, so um, it's very rare that if we have to retreat an Andres with the second flow diverter if we have chosen to place just one at the beginning. Uh, could have been, well, we have treated more or less 1,000 enemies with flow diverters, and probably we have uh, done that in maybe less than 10. Um, but we do place more than one flow diverter at the moment of the treatment. And this is usually either because the neck is too long for just one flow diverter, of course, uh, but also sometimes because we really want to reinforce the diversion effect. Uh, uh, why? Because we may have a very big jet inside the aneurysm and we want to, to turn it on the other side. And if you just place one flow diverter, that jet, it's difficult to really uh, move it uh, in a different direction. So you, you need to place maybe a second one or a third one to make it a stronger construct with a, a, a more dense, uh, um, uh, filaments uh, and and so in this case uh, uh, that would be probably two or three percent of the cases so in very the highest uh, number of cases we just use one single flow diverter and the coiling the coiling um, uh, uh, we use it almost always when the energy is larger than 15 millimeter uh, if it's intradural, of course, not in intracavernous aneurysm, but intradural. Why? Because we think that the risk of rupture of these um, large uh, or giant aneurysm is becomes higher with the dimension of the aneurysm. So um, it, we think that it's better to place coiling. We still have ruptures even with coiling. Rare, very rare, but we do still have ruptures even with coiling. But uh, uh, with hope that by placing coils, we will have a less risk of rupture. Thank so you very much. About 15 millimeters. Thank you, thank you. My greetings to Marco, please. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, Could I ask? Yes, of course, Vasilis, please go on. Uh, Dr. Bocardi, hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, a technical uh, detail. Uh, what was the criterion to put the flow diverter? You showed uh, two pica aneurysms, one at the beginning and what at the end. Why did you choose to put the uh, flow diverter inside the pica in the first case? And why in the vertebral uh, artery in the second case? 
That's a very good question. Maybe there is no answer, but the, 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 the number one answer is that the first one had was a little bit, the pica was larger. So it allowed the, the placement of a flow diverter. And also it was uh, further away, more far from the origin of the pica. Um, it, so the change in flow might not be as uh, uh, effective as in the second case. And especially that the second, with the one which ruptured, was probably a dissecting anything. So uh, dissection may cure by themselves. Uh, and you just need to uh, let them um, uh, be behave correctly without re-rupturing in the, in the early phases. And I think that by placing a flow diverter in the early phase, we just change the flow inside the endris, making it more, more simple, more um, fluid. And in this way, uh, the dissection probably just cured by itself. It's, it's a scar, it's a, a wound in the wall of the artery that just uh, uh, cures uh, by scarring. Uh, the other one was really a very, a, a real aneurysm. And so probably it will not have changed with that, uh, with that technique. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe uh, a last question, Dr. Bocardi, is uh, so for me, who is no, I'm not an endovascular uh, guy, uh, let me understand that if I understood that correctly, some flow is uh, accepted uh, after pipeline uh, for a few weeks inside the aneurysm. Is that correct? Absolutely. So, and that will wave off uh, through the weeks. Uh my belief is that as soon as you place the flow diverter, so immediately during the you change the the behavior of the flow inside the energy. So you the cure comes at the moment you place the flow diverter. Then okay. there is the visibility of the energy, which takes time. And of course, we are used to say that until you see the energy, it's not cured. It's not true with flow diverters because even if you see it, it's no more the energy that was before. The flow inside the energy has completely changed. It's no uh, the, the the idea that that it could rupture uh, after flow diversion just because uh, um, it's still there, it's still visible. It has not been proven in any way. So flat, uh, flow diverters uh, energy treated with flow diverters don't re-rupture. There are the some that rupture, yes, uh, and those are the big ones, as we said before, be because of the um, thrombus formation inside the aneurysm, not because the aneurysm is still open and this can rupture. No, once you place the flow diverters, it's already cured. Can I ask <laughs> yes, a very yes. quick question here? <laughs> of course, of course, Thames. Dr. Bocardi, thank you for your presentation. And does this also apply, your last comment, yes. does this also apply for blisters? Where we know that maybe, maybe there isn't even a real wall of the aneurysm. I understand that for, obviously I understand that for all the rest, but uh, what do you think about blister cases? Thank you, Temistocles, and, uh, and thank you for inviting me here. It's always nice to see, to see you. Uh, I, uh, I think that flow diverter is the best treatment for blisters. Of course, it, it is not a 100% uh, success like everything. So we do have uh, uh, re-ruptures, but they are very rare compared to the usual re-rupture of, of blister aneurysms. And again, I think that the uh, blisters are due to the fact that the carotid artery is uh, uh, um, disease that not only in that point, but the whole segment of the supraclinoid carotid artery is diseased. So by placing the flow diverter, you reinforce the whole segment. It's not only the whole, the little hole where the, that came from. So absolutely, I believe that that's the best treatment for, for uh, blister aneurysms. Dr. Arkondakis, do you have a question or a comment you want to say? Uh, yes, hi, Dodi. Ciao. How are you? Uh, so uh, nowadays we use longer flows. Okay, we don't use the telescopic technique we had at the beginning. 
And I think it's very, very useful for us now, because you remember in the basilar uh, uh, shaft, the aneurysm, we had to put one inside the other. Uh, you think, uh, does this help now? Yes, um, we, we have always pushed for long flow diverters. So whenever you have to treat an aneurysm, it's better to have a longer than just the neck of the aneurysm. Uh, and the longer it is, the best is the flow diversion because uh, it really takes the flow and, and it brings it uh, away. If you have just a little bit of flow diverter, maybe it's not as effective. So yes, uh, I think that longer is better. Okay, thank you very okay. much, uh, Dr. Bocardi. This was uh, wonderful, wonderful to have you with us. Uh, I see you have a lot of friends in the Greek uh, <laughs> yes. uh, neuroscience community. Uh, so please uh, come back soon. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. It was quite effective. Λοιπόν, επιστρέφουμε λίγο στο ελληνικό πρόγραμμα. Έχουμε μείνει λίγο πίσω. Θα κάνουμε πολύ γρήγορα δύο ερωτήσει από το κοινό. Μία... Τρει ερωτήσει έχουμε. Η μία θα την απευθύνω στον Θέμη. Θέμη, εάν έχει ρόλο ή όχι μονολεκτικά, έχει ρόλο η χρήση ενδοκυλιακή νικαρδιπίνη σε περίπτωση αγκιόσπασμου μέσω EVT. Δεν υπάρχει κάτι στι οδηγίε, οπότε μάλλον η απάντηση είναι όχι. Ωραία. Ερώτηση δεύτερη στον Βασίλη. Εάν χρειάζεται σε περίπτωση που χειρουργήσει σε ένα ανέβρισμα που έχει ήδη πριν έχει γίνει κόιλινγκ, αν είναι απαραίτητο ή όχι να βγάλει τα κόιλ. Ε, δεν είναι απαραίτητο, αυτή είναι η απάντηση, εφόσον υπάρχει αρκετό αφιένα για να τοποθετηθεί το κλειπ. Μόνο Ωραία. σε περίπτωση που πιέζει, έχει uh, mass effect, θα πρέπει να αφαιρεθούν τα κόιλ, ή σε περίπτωση τεχνικά που uh, δεν υπάρχει. Απαρκής, επαρκής αφιένας, τότε πρέπει να γίνει μια προσωρινή, με ένα προσωρινό κλιπ σύγκληση των πλευρικών αρτηριών και αφαίρεση των κόλλης και στη συνέχεια ε, κλίπιν. Πάω και πάλι στον Θέμη, ε, ασθενής που έρχεται με οξύεδροκεφαλία. Πώς θα αντιμετωπίσεις ε, την οξύεδροκεφαλία, ε, γιατί ε, μπορεί να αφήλεται να καλύπτει την εικόνα της παραχνοηδούς, αν είναι ή αν είναι πραγματικά υδροκεφαλία. Έχει ένδειξη να κάνεις κάποια μέτρηση ενδοκράνειας πίεσης. Προφανώς στο κομματόδι ασθενή, γιατί αυτό καταλαβαίνω ότι ρωτάει, ε, ο κομματόδις ασθενής ε, οφείλει να έχει ένα καμίνο. Όποιο και είναι το αίτιο, ο κομματόδις ασθενής με ενδοκράνεια παθολογία έχει ένα καμίνο, άρα μπορεί να μας απαντήσει στο ερώτημα αν υπάρχουν ή όχι αυξημένες και πίεσεις και ανάλογα να δράσουμε. Ε, Προφανώ, εάν δεν υπάρχουν αυξημένε πιέσει, ακόμα και αν απεικονιστικά βλέπουμε αύξηση ε, των κυλιών και λόγω του κινδύνου ο οποίο υπάρχει με την τοποθέτηση τη κυλοστομία για ρήξη του ανεβρίσματο, δεν κάνουμε τίποτα. Okay. Σε αυξημένε πιέσει βάζουμε μια κυλοστομία την οποία κρατάμε ψηλά. Νομίζω ότι έχουμε απαντήσει στι ερωτήσει. Ε, προχωράμε λοιπόν στην επόμενη παρουσίαση.